CI data excerpts. CI on macrophilosophy. Macrophilosophy is a system for relating all things from the smallest, micro, to the largest, macro. Its basic tenets are that all things are not only related, but macrocosmically one, and that what is, is perfect. Things are only separate and divisible from a micro-limited viewpoint. Macrophilosophy envisions a microcosmic-macrocosmic continuum, called the MM continuum, and that's lowercase m dash uppercase m continuum, in which neurons, protons, and electrons are indivisible parts of ever larger physical bodies such as man. Continuing, we can perceive man as an indivisible part of a third planet called Earth. Again, enlarging our perspective, we can perceive this planet as an indivisible part of a solar system, which is, in turn, an individual part of a galaxy, which is, in turn, an indivisible part of, and so on and so on. Man feels pain and loneliness and experiences sickness and death to the extent that he, one, feels separate and divided from self, others, universe, God, or the macrocosm. Two, he denies the perfection of what is. Three, he refuses to accept exclusive responsibility for all that he experiences. Why does the feeling of separateness cause anxiety? Because anything or anyone that we perceive as separate, foreign, or alien to us is a potential threat potentially anxiety-producing. To the degree that we feel oneness or union with anything or anyone, we can feel comfortable, accepting, and loving, the opposite of anxiety. From a macro perspective, all human suffering, fear, hate, pain, and disease are the result of lack of faith that all is one, all is love. All is what you might call God. All is perfect. This doesn't mean that negative thoughts, feelings, and actions don't exist. It points out that they are the product of unbalanced micro-thinking. All the great religions of the world have proclaimed that as you sow, so shall you reap. Macro-philosophy presents this in terms of the consequences of negative and positive thought patterns. If you are afraid that something will happen, it usually does, because that's what you've spent your mental thought energy on. The wise man in Proverbs 23.7, over 2,000 years ago, stated that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Macrophilosophy holds that a negative thought produces a negative feeling and a negative experience, while a positive thought produces a positive feeling and a positive experience. No thought is ever forgotten. All our thoughts reside in our subconscious mind, what the ancients called the heart, where each negative thought continues to produce negative feelings until it's balanced or canceled. A plus and a minus equals zero by a positive thought of equal intensity or strength. Negative thoughts produce anxiety, psychological pain, such as fear, anxiety, frustration, guilt, depression, sadness, etc. We try to avoid negative feelings by denying their existence. That is, instead of recognizing that we cause our own negative feelings by thinking negative thoughts, we try to avoid our negative feelings by using psychological defense mechanisms such as repression, projection, and rationalization, to name a few. All defense mechanisms are designed to reduce or eliminate psychological pain by reducing or eliminating our awareness of our uncomfortable feelings. Thus, we reduce our self-awareness to tiny micro-perspectives. One very common technique is to shift the responsibility for our discomfort from ourselves to someone else or something else. Then are listed the mechanisms for defending the micro-self. In the world of psychology, these are called defense mechanisms. The first one is acting out. Reducing the anxiety aroused by forbidden desires by permitting their expression. The second is compensation, making up for frustration in one area by overgratification in another or detracting attention from a weakness by emphasizing a strength. The third is denial of reality, protecting micro-self from an undesirable aspect of reality by denying its existence or ignoring it, often by getting sick or over-involvement with job or hobby, etc. The fourth is displacement, discharging feelings, usually hostility, on people or objects less dangerous than those which arouse the feelings. The fifth, emotional insulation, is withdrawing from emotional involvement to protect self from hurt. The sixth is fantasy, gratifying frustrated desires by imagining their achievement. The seventh is identification, increasing feelings of worth by identifying self with illustrious person or organization. 
The eighth is interjection, adopting values of others to avoid rejection. The ninth is isolation, prohibiting self from feeling the pain caused by hurtful situations or separating incompatible attitudes into logic-tight compartments. Projection, attributing one's own unethical desires to others or putting blame on others for one's difficulties. The eleventh is rationalization, attempting to rationally prove that one's behavior is justifiable and deserving of approval. The twelfth is reaction formation, preventing expression of dangerous or socially unacceptable desires by overemphasizing their opposite. The thirteenth is regression, retreating to earlier level of development which demands less mature behavior and or a lower level of aspiration. The fourteenth is repression, blocking painful or dangerous thoughts from consciousness. The fifteenth is sublimation, gratifying frustrated sexual desires by substituting non-sexual activities. The sixteenth is sympathism, gaining sympathy from others to bolster feelings of self-worth. The seventeenth is undoing or atonement, that is, atoning for immoral desires or actions by causing self to suffer. The consequences of reducing psychological pain by using these techniques of self-denial are, from the short-term, micro point of view, successful in reducing psychological pain. In other words, they do work. That's why we use them. However, they are only temporarily successful because they reduce our awareness so much that we can conveniently forget that from the larger macro perspective, all our feelings are caused only by our own thoughts, never by anyone else's. Perhaps the most important consequence of psychological defense mechanisms is the inevitable development of psychological stress which wears and tears the body down until it becomes sick, ages, and eventually dies. Research in this area was first developed in the 1930s under the leadership of Dr. Hans Selye, M.D., who summed up his research by stating that if there is no stress or resistance, there can be no disease, pain, or death. The ultimate consequence of using these techniques of self-denial is greater pain or psychological stress, because they never eliminate the cause, negative thoughts. They just temporarily reduce the result, negative feelings. A dramatic example would be the case of alcoholics or drug addicts, which were so prevalent during the latter half of the 20th century. To reduce psychological pain, they knocked out, that is denied, vast portions of their minds but to temporarily gain relief from their feelings of discomfort and were rewarded by pleasurable feelings. But the causes were not eliminated and when the alcohol or drug wore off, the psychological pain was always greater. So long as they refused to accept responsibility for their own discomfort, they were doomed to remain addicts until the pain became so great that nothing reduced it. Then, and only then, were they ready to accept responsibility for their own negative thoughts, to ask for help, to learn a larger perspective, and grow beyond their pain to a new life philosophy, a more macro perspective, a new thought, a new truth. What is truth? Well, it depends on whose viewpoint you're using. From one point of view, there is nothing either true or false, good or bad, painful or pleasurable, ugly or beautiful, but thinking makes it so. A dramatic example of this is illustrated through the use of hypnosis. Having an arm or a leg slowly cut off is exceedingly painful, yet some of our 20th century physicians and dentists use hypnosis to perform every kind of operation, to the extent that, and as long as, the patient is able to accept the deep hypnotic suggestion that no pain exists. He feels no pain. Thus, thousands of cases demonstrate that we can only feel or experience anything to the extent that we believe we can feel or experience it. From a micro viewpoint, the way you think and thus feel is determined by heredity and environment, neither of which you have any control over. Therefore, your scientists said that man had no free will and that all behavior was completely determined by blind chance. And this is true from a microview. Unfortunately, this microview denies that there is a larger perspective. The world is flat as any fool can plainly see. And from a limited micro viewpoint, the world is flat, or concave if in a valley, or convex if on a hilltop. Thus, the size of your perspective determines what truth is within that frame of reference.
most of your scientists denied the existence or practicality of larger perspectives such as the macro perspective which includes reincarnation soul and macrocosmic levels it is ironic that psychology as generally taught in your time denied the existence of a psyche mind or soul and insisted that psychologists could only know physical or sensory data thus macro philosophy concepts were quite unacceptable to scientists with a micro orientation the macro perspective sees man as a great mind unlimited by time and space sometimes called an immortal soul which periodically elects to temporarily inhabit various types of vehicles called bodies in order to experience and learn greater awareness in its striving toward greater perfection that is awareness that all is one the ultimate purpose of all souls in all their experience is to attain this macrocosmic awareness of their oneness with all that is all that was and all that ever will be what some would call god another way of looking at these levels of awareness could be one the micro self is an individual's body personality and limited conscious mind which believes that this is all that there is of an individual two the evolving self or subconscious mind knows that it is only one tiny part of a soul and three the macro self or universal mind knows that all is one and therefore is aware that the macro self contains within it a perfect balance of the positive and negative polarity of all dimensions while there may be a temporary imbalance in individual souls which causes their lack of macro awareness these individual imbalances when seen from a macro perspective are recognized as the natural life rhythms of a perfectly balanced macrocosm in other words there are no problems at the macro level eventually all souls will attain this perfect level of total awareness no matter how dark the night eventually the light of day and the sun must come while mystics in all ages have described this ultimate macro awareness perhaps the best known and most available reference to this macro perspective is found in the seventh chapter of the gospel of john in the bible in this chapter the great macro philosopher states this macro purpose or goal of all souls as that they may be one as we are one i in them and thou in me may they be perfectly one it is only from this macro viewpoint in which the human soul and subconscious mind perceive its oneness with all minds superconscious universal mind macrocosm or god that the soul cannot be threatened or become fearful of anything because all is one thus it is only from this macro viewpoint that the soul can obey the ultimate or macro commandment love one another as i have loved you which is presented in john fifteen twelve macro philosophy teaches that what is right or wrong for anyone depends on one's frame of reference or perspective for instance while it was right for the christian to eat pork it was wrong for the jew or moslem while it was wrong to kill others during your peace time it was right during war time this type of right and wrong belongs in the context of social law or custom and is totally determined by the size of one's perspective most people in your time did not recognize that their personal philosophy determined whether they were fat or thin healthy or unhealthy and most of all happy or unhappy if you examine the size the temporal dimension of your personal philosophy or perspective you will recognize that it is the size of your perspective which determines your awareness of the consequences of your choices for instance if hedonistic pleasure is your major goal and your temporal perspective is quite limited you will be unaware of the long-range consequences of overindulgence you will eat too much become fat and eventually sick you will avoid strenuous physical and mental activity and become physically and mentally flabby and eventually both unhealthy and unhappy since everyone seeks pleasure it is extremely important that you become aware of the size of your perspective for short-term pleasure frequently causes long-term pain if you are really interested in maximizing pleasure you must expand your perspective in order to become aware of the long-term consequences pleasure pain of your personal philosophy and the choices it determines those who are micro-bound cannot truly comprehend anything beyond the physical view of man concepts such as the subconscious or soul or brotherhood of man are merely abstractions for micro-man in other words he cannot feel related brotherly or loving for any extended period of time he basically feels alienated and separate from his self 
his own subconscious, and thus must feel alienated and separate from others. The Emperor Marcus Aurelius said to be vexed at anything which happens is a separation of ourselves from nature. He was presenting the macro view that all is one, and that, from this macro perspective, there could be no vexation or anger with anything, since everything that is is perfect. It is only when man forgets that he is macro-perfect and all-powerful that he feels inadequate, threatened, abused, fearful, frustrated, angry, or sad. He who forgets his past is doomed to repeat it. To the extent that man can expand his awareness of his past, he is freed from repeating it. If he cannot remember that it made him sick to eat or drink too much in the past, he will repeat these actions and pay the consequences over and over again until he can remember. All learning is the process of remembering the past and applying the lessons that you learned from it. If you could remember everything, you would realize your macrocosmic origin. The soul was once consciously united and one with all souls, everything, God. Some souls became bored. They desired to experience an imperfect event, an exciting, fearful, pleasurable, painful, carnal event. To do this, the soul elected, that is, chose, to narrow the focus of its consciousness or awareness until it could not remember who it was, where it came from, or where it was going. It was then that it mentally divided itself into cells, each of which pretended it was a whole soul. In this state of self-induced amnesia and division, the soul could experience pride and exaltation over others because it had forgotten that it was one with all. It had even forgotten its own soulmates, members of the group of souls, who regularly incarnate together, and its own twin souls, those souls who are cells of the same oversoul and thus have identical soul vibrations. In this state of amnesia, the soul could perceive other souls as enemies because it viewed itself as separate from them. Like the mad paranoic who thinks his fingers are trying to strangle him because he has forgotten that he controls them, the souls forgot that they were all-powerful and that from a macro view, they made all the decisions and chose all the results. Since they had forgotten their greater selves' power, they were doomed to live in the unbalanced, imperfect, micro-world they created, where no one could remember his past and thus no one could foresee the future. No one can see the end of the journey if his vision is so limited to a just a tiny part of the whole journey. No one can make sense of the jigsaw puzzle if he can only see a few of its million pieces. Since all time is simultaneous, the pieces of the puzzle, past and future, are hidden from our own minds. However, all the relatively wise souls have relearned to expand their consciousness or awareness in order to remember more of the past and future, and thus see more pieces of the cosmic puzzle. The great problem of humanity is to evolve to a point where you can accept total responsibility for absolutely everything you experience. This paves the way for the ultimate challenge, joyous acceptance of the absolute perfection of all that is, all that was, and all that ever will be. You can see, then, that the measure of a mind's evolution is its acceptance of the unacceptable. CI on the Macro Society By 2150, the world has been almost completely united by a universal educational system that begins at birth and ends formally at the 30th birthday. This monolithic educational system combines the five institutions of society, family, education, religion, business, and government, into one interdependent whole called the Macro Society. The 20th century's prophets of doom for mankind, such as Orwell and Huxley, were, like most others, caught in the limited micro-viewpoint of the 20th century. This micro-viewpoint saw man as basically an unbalanced animal doomed to destroy himself with his own selfishness and technical skills which developed destructive devices and massive environmental pollution. The 20th century was dominated by micro-thinking, characterized by hedonistic momentary pleasure-seeking. A typical example was the politician who put his own temporary welfare ahead of the long-term welfare of all people, including his own children, when he voted against pollution controls because industry in his district thought it was too expensive. There are many other examples of selfish short-term micro-thinking, such as the belief that war was justified and that billions of dollars spent each year on guns and such devices for killing each other was more noble patriotic duty than removing the cause of human conflict which was ignorance. 
educational opportunities were unequal and limited by local, special, micro-interests which were dedicated to helping a few at the expense of many. The most basic institution of the micro-society, the family, traditionally taught each new generation narrow micro-ethnocentric loyalties and prejudices and perpetuated the social patterns of stratification and segregation. Thus the micro-family fostered human separation by teaching paramount loyalty to a biological family rather than a spiritual one. In so doing, it denied the universal brotherhood of all men. With this micro-philosophy espousing narrow micro-loyalties, separation and conflict were inevitable. Finally, with the development of weapons having almost unlimited destructive power, the human race had to choose between their extinction or the development of a larger macro-philosophy with loyalty to the universal brotherhood of all men. By the end of the 20th century, micro-thinking produced environmental pollution, overpopulation, and human conflict to such an extreme that the micro-family almost literally destroyed itself. For the human race to survive, the micro-family had to give way. The human survivors of the early 21st century accepted the practical benefits of the macro-philosophy long proposed by such giants as Lao Tzu, Gautama, and Jesus. This macro-perspective of mankind proclaimed one spiritual, macrocosmic father for all. Call no man father, Matthew 23, 9, and one categorical imperative, love one another, John 15, 17. Since ignorance and denial of these macro-concepts had been perpetuated by micro-social institutions, they were replaced by one unifying structure called the macro-society. This universal social system provided and integrated the functions of education, government, religion, and procreation. The development and existence of the macro-society depended on its ability to educate all its members with a macro-philosophy which produced macro-loyalty and identity. It minimized selfish micro-behavior in its members and maximized unselfish macro-behavior. All hostile, angry behavior is viewed by the macro-society as a product of micro-thinking, which is dedicated to protecting the micro-self or micro-group against others who are viewed as outsiders. There are no outsiders from a macro-view. Of course, the obvious tremendous advantages of the macro-society are in the use of one language, one culture, one religion, macro-philosophy, one government, and one race, the human race. Microman didn't give up his micro-loyalties to his family, religion, government, skin color, language, and culture without a fight. He literally perished in his struggle to maintain the divisions that kept the human race from being united and free from fear, hatred, and ignorance. The age of Microman is almost over, and those humans still living on this earth will soon all be macro-beings, who are both willing and able to learn and to live a larger loyalty, a larger perspective, a macro-perspective. These highly evolved beings will devote their major energies and resources to developing an educational system which will foster ever greater sensitivity and awareness of self-other macrocosm relationships. The goal of this educational system will always be to produce macro-loyalty and macro-identity. Psychologists of the 20th century held that during the early learning periods, basic life personality patterns were formed. In the micro-family, by the end of six years, a child had learned self-alienation, paranoid patterns inculcated by the parents and reinforced by the society. People believed that they were the pawns of their early experiences, unaware that they could at any time be whatever they wanted to be and believed they could be. By 2150, children no longer have to enter this world by micro-accident and grow up in a society which is unwilling to provide optimum health, nutrition, and educational opportunities for all children. Children can now enter the macro-society which both wants and loves them. Each new member encounters an environment designed to provide optimum freedom to explore and succeed in the uniquely human task of manipulating verbal symbols. Each child experiences unconditional love from other members of his society and thus learns to value self-others and trust self-others and to enjoy learning. Positive self-concepts are developed by constant interaction with adults possessing positive self-concepts and children are taught the responsibility of and the art of creating their own life experiences. Since the macro-society established universal spiritual brotherhood, 
Its organizational structure is very different from that of the microfamily. A central concept of the macro society is the law of inverse loyalty. The smaller the unit, the less loyalty owed to its members. Thus, in a test of loyalty, God, macrocosm, universal mind will always win. And by God, I mean all that is, as opposed to some special group or individual. The importance of this concept of inverse loyalty can be recognized when it is understood that the macro society is composed of units, the smallest of which is 10, expanding in multiples of 10, 10, 100, 1,000, etc., until the largest unit includes all humanity who are working toward the macro level of awareness. This is the total macro society and represents the final culmination of man's long struggle to attain peace and goodwill to all men. This universal spiritual brotherhood is impossible for microman practice because, from his limited perspective, he is unable to truly perceive his relationship to self, others, macrocosm, God. The basic unit of the macro society is called the Alpha. It is composed of ten individuals, five males, five females, one of whom serves as the Alpha, or leader of the group. This leader is elected on a yearly basis by all members of the group and is authorized to resolve all internal disputes in order to maximize group harmony and cooperation. The Alpha members share a common living area, 90 yards square, which is divided into seven rooms. Six rooms are 30 feet square, and the seventh is 30 by 90 and is their common room. Five of the six rooms are shared by Alpha mates, always a male and a female, while the sixth is a kitchen and dining area. Since all units in the macro society are multiples of 10, the next unit, called the beta, is composed of 10 alphas and consists of 100 members, 50 male and 50 female. These members also elect annually a leader, the betar, to perform the same functions for this larger unit as the alpha for the smaller unit. In case of a tie election, the leader of the next larger unit casts the tie-breaking vote. The beta occupies one whole floor, 150 yards square, which contains the 10 alphas. The next units in order of size are called the gamma, the delta, the atone. The leader of the gamma, called the gammar, is also elected annually, and the leaders of the next two larger units, the delta and the azar, are elected every three years in order to provide them with greater experience in these more responsible positions. Each gamma is housed in a building which is 150 yards square and 12 stories high. Ten for the betas, one for maintenance, and one divided into an auditorium, meeting rooms, and recreation area. The delta, which is composed of ten gamma buildings, is arranged around a man-made lake which is five miles long by two miles wide with an average depth of thirty feet. The ten gamma buildings are spaced one mile apart on each side of the lake. At one end of the lake is a building devoted to administration and maintenance, while the central information computer and research center are housed in a building at the other end of the lake. All 12 buildings in the delta are 150 yards square and have 12 floors. These buildings and the lake are at the center of a 100 square mile area of land divided into cultivated park and farmland called delta sections. The leaders of the next larger units, the Zetar, Ketar, Mutar, and Maxar, are elected every six years by the leaders of the next smaller units. For example, all Ketars, who are leaders of 10 million people, are elected by 10 Atars and must have had experience in the positions of Atar and Zetar. The Maxar, as leader of one billion people in a Maxon, must have served at least 21 years in the lesser positions of Atar, Zetar, Ketar, and Mutar. And he or she must have been selected four times by his peers as the wisest among them. 2150's macro society population of 300 million has no Maxars. When the macro society was in its early stages, the work life of its members was designed to permit and encourage personal evolution. To ensure that work periods would not become micro unpleasant or be used as escape from other self-development tasks, all workers worked only six hours per day, only five days per week. A one-week vacation was taken every three months by everyone 15 years or older. Here, in the middle of the 22nd century, the early work rules are no longer necessary since high-level macro beings do not divide their lives into work and recreation. They realize that human creativity and productivity are best served by accepting the will of their higher selves. The result of this acceptance can now be seen in the macro society, which has produced the most creative, productive period in the history of this planet. Since effective personal evolution is the paramount goal of the macro society, all persons take whatever time they wish to work toward this goal after their formal education has been completed. 
Formal education begins at birth and ends at the age of 30, though informal learning is highly valued at all ages. These first 30 years are divided into 10 triads of 3 years each. The first triad begins at birth and ends at the third birthday. The second triad begins on the third birthday and ends at the sixth birthday. Thus, the end of one triad is always the beginning of the next one. This reinforces the concept the end of one experience is always the beginning of another. This triad system facilitates concentration on the developmental tasks during the first 30 years, covered by the first 10 triads. It is especially designed to permit older children within each triad to teach the younger ones. The older students improve their learning of lessons by demonstrating these lessons to the younger students. It also inculcates a strong sense of responsibility for self and others. The first three years of life are very important in human development since they contain the greatest number of critical learning periods. If the appropriate developmental task is not learned during its critical learning period, it will be more difficult to learn the task at a later time. For this reason, only persons who have demonstrated outstanding patience, love, and wisdom qualify to work with the first triad children. Each newborn child is placed in an alpha devoted to first triad children and is assigned five older brothers and five older sisters. These older persons will be most carefully selected from the 8th, 9th, and 10th triads, ages 21 through 30, and from older age groups. One of the problems of micro-parents has been the fatigue and frustration brought on by many hours and days of constant interaction with their children. To eliminate this problem, each older brother or sister, like other workers in the macro society, spends an average of four hours daily on the job. They will rotate this time in order to equally experience both waking and sleeping periods of the child's life. The second three years of life, from three to six years, is another very important learning period. Again, only those five older brothers and five older sisters who have demonstrated outstanding patience, love, and wisdom will be assigned to each child of this second triad. Older brothers and sisters always work with the triad level they are personally best equipped to work with. The minimum age limit for these second triad candidates is 21. Those who are gifted with exceptional ability in working with these younger children will have an opportunity to practice and demonstrate this ability. Those who have demonstrated outstanding patience, love, and wisdom with the second triad children will then go on to work with the first triad if they prove effective there. In the third and fourth triad, each pair of alpha mates is assigned an older brother and sister who are also alpha mates. This older brother and sister will be assigned from the 6th through 10th triads. Members of the 3rd through 6th triads are also assigned personal evolution tutors who have specialized in tutoring children from these triads. Because of constant interaction and acceptance, there is no generation gap. All students experience at least 5 hours of personal evolution tutoring per week. This time is devoted to learning to understand self, others, the macrocosm, and your relationship to them. Learning to responsibly create your life experiences, accept them as chosen by you and you only, learning to identify the lessons within each experience, then apply them to your daily life, learning to take the risks necessary to grow, and learning to accept everything as absolutely perfect for its time and place are some of the areas of concentration during personal evolution tutoring. The 7th through 10th triad students, age 18 to 30, are also assigned personal evolution tutors. These are selected from the wisest and most mature persons in the whole macro society with a minimum age of 30. These students also experience at least 5 hours of tutoring per week. A typical day for triad 3 through 5 is 7 to 9 a.m. macro contemplation and meditation, statement or affirmation of one's lifestyle plan for growing, and breakfast with one's alpha. 9 to 10 a.m. study life areas with CI. 10 to 12 noon macro development. Groups of 10 students discuss with master tutors life areas they studied with CI. Noon to 1 p.m., lunch and relaxation with Alpha Unit. 1 to 2, work with CI. 2 to 5, recreation and learning. 5 to 7, macro dance, swim, and dinner. 7 to 10, personal evolution tutoring activities, macro contemplation and meditation, and restatement of one's own lifestyle plan for growing. The macro pause is used regularly throughout the day as needed to expand one's immediate perspective. Triads 6 through 10 have a similar daily schedule. However, at least three hours per day are scheduled for practicing vocational activities. These activities are in the areas of tutoring, agriculture, and other applied arts and sciences. In addition, these older students are provided more time for solitary contemplation and meditation, often in the park areas outside. 
Beginning in the third triad, ages 6 through 9, students select their own alphar. A student beta unit is composed of 10 alphas, including triads 1 through 10, ages 0 through 30. However, the student betar is elected only by students in the last six triads, ages 12 through 30. Since the proportion of the population under 30 is maintained at 10% of the total population, every delta unit in the macro society contains one student gamma unit and nine adult gamma units. By the year 2100, computers and servo mechanisms performed all the monotonous and heavy labor tasks that contributed to making man's work life so boring throughout recorded history. It is recognized that there is a time for people to be together and a time for each individual to be alone. Time for solitary contemplation and meditation is provided every day with each individual having a study and meditation room in which to be alone. In addition to this indoor solitude, the large wooded areas surrounding the living units provide very beautiful walks where one can be alone with nature. Here in 2150, no one living in the macro society fears being alone. However, no one sleeps alone either, for each alpha provides five bedrooms where a male and female always sleep together. In the macro society, sex is not used as a defense or escape mechanism. There are no hidden, dark, fearful areas in macro minds. It is recognized that each person needs a mate to grow with, to check out their perception of reality with, to love, to be loved intimately by, and to accelerate evolution. The vow of one alpha mate to the other is to live with, to help, and to honor, as long as it is best for our evolution. The goal of the macro society is always balanced, harmonious union. The oppressive clinging and neurotic dependency of the traditional micro family is now just a historic curiosity and nightmare. Macro man is free to dedicate his life to attaining conscious awareness of the unity of all things. He is able to love all things, both great and small. For the first time in recorded history of formal education, learning is always rewarding, practical, and free from intimidation and coercion. No dreary, pointless memorization of facts for regurgitation on competitive exams. Only practical performance demonstrates degrees of competence or skill in any area of learning. All students are, with the aid of resource persons, tutors, and the learning machine called CI, free to develop to their own capacity the verbal and numerical skills along with their own special aptitudes or gifts. With the evolution of macro-awareness, the last great fear of micro-man, death, has been vanquished. For macro-man has expanded his awareness to the point where he can remember some of his other lives. Thus, the theory of reincarnation, spiritual evolution of the soul through experiencing many human lives, and personal responsibility, what you sow you must reap, is no longer theory but living conscious truth, which it always was for those who had a macro perspective. Since ever-expanding awareness is the goal of the macro society, the greatest cultural rewards are given to those who demonstrate outstanding wisdom and love for others. The 20th century valued its athletes and entertainers far more than its wise and kindly people, and they reaped chaos. In the 22nd century, macro society does not forget this lesson. The next section is CI on Micro Man. For ages, Micro Man, with his extremely limited awareness of himself, has been demonstrating the truth of the saying that he who forgets his past is doomed to repeat it. He has forgotten that he is part of an immortal soul, created out of the substance of the macrocosm, universal mind, God, in the image or pattern of this universal mind. He has forgotten that in addition to his physical body, he has a soul body, astral body, of a much higher vibration, which is, therefore, invisible to his physical eyes, just as x-rays are invisible. He has forgotten that he periodically chooses to incarnate his soul, mind, and body in dense matter body, which he can see with microvision and thus believes to be his only body. Human souls over eons of time narrowed and limited their awareness from macrocosmic to microscopic. By practicing ever more limited perspectives, they lost their powers of greater awareness much the same as fish living in the lightless depths of the ocean lost their ability to see. Why did this happen? It happened because the souls desired to experience self-centered micro-worlds. Since micro-man cannot remember his past and thus his own responsibility for choosing his state of existence, he has been doomed to live many lives filled with fear, anger, conflict, and brutish pain and pleasure. He has been dominated by the ever-present fear of death, which he desperately tries to deny and repress 
through all manner of activities designed to provide momentary forgetfulness. Alcohol, drugs, war, and even work, games, and sex have been used to help microman forget his lonely, alienated existence that will soon be ended forever by death. He has even invented mythical gods, heavens, and hells to help him deny his feelings of fear and inadequacy. Fortunately, there have always been a few beings who have had greater awareness and thus could remember more than others. These beings have too often been viciously persecuted, jailed, burned, and crucified. However, they've pointed the way to the only real hope of liberation from a micro-perspective. Over many ages, their cumulative effect has become ever greater. Microman has grown weary of micro-experiences and is trying to return to his original state of macrocosmic awareness. When each incarnated soul can, at last, remember his oneness with all that is, all that was, and all that ever will be, he will no longer be able to blame others for his own misfortunes. Suffering Microman has long proclaimed his lack of responsibility by wailing that he never asked to be born. When man has expanded his awareness to the point where he can remember his own macro past, he will know that he alone created it through his own choosing. He will then realize that he alone is responsible for all he experiences. With this macrocosmic awareness, man will know that he must inevitably reap what he sows, and all conflict between individuals, races, and nations will be eliminated. On page 340, we go on to CI on Akashic Records. Akashic Records is an ancient concept that refers to the macrocosm's memory of itself. From a macro perspective, all is one infinite mind, and all experiences are recorded forever in that mind. Thus, when you attain total macro-awareness, you will know and experience all that has happened or ever will happen. The Akashic Records refer to that dimension of the mind where, if your level of awareness permits, you can experience any event that has ever happened. For those with less than 10th level awareness, their own personal Akashic Record is more like a series of videotapes which present only pictures and sounds of past events. Every soul has this Akashic Record of all of its experiences since its creation, which was the beginning of its devolution from total macro-awareness. Thus, when you examine that portion of your soul or macro-mind in which your memories are stored, you are consulting your own personal Akashic Records. You can relive any past event that your soul has experienced to the extent that you can remember your Akashic Records. Level 10s usually use the universal Akashic Records where a total macro perspective is available. However, a soul's ability to contact these universal Akashic Records is limited by its level of awareness. The next section is CI on Dreams. For the student of macro philosophy, the quickest and easiest access to the macro levels of awareness is through dreams. No matter how limited microman's awareness is while he's awake, during the sleep, subconscious or soul mind takes over. It uses dreams to provide solutions to problems, to expand your awareness, to relax and refresh the body by solving mental stress, to digest today, and to prepare you for tomorrow. When man learns to remember and interpret his dreams from a macro view, he has access to a level of wisdom that provides solutions to all problems. If a man refuses to accept responsibility for his own life situation, his dreams cannot help him, and neither can anything else except more of his self-inflicted misery. The next section is CI on expanded human awareness. There are three popularly employed e-mental techniques for expanding human awareness. The macro pause, the mini meditation, the macro immersion, the macro contact. One. The submacro pause is historically the first breakthrough to conscious control of macro awareness. Once the macro self or universal mind had been rediscovered by the ancients, they began practicing developing the necessary desire and belief which would allow the practice of mind shifting. By mind shifting, we mean the conscious shifting of mind focus from the micro level of physical body and mind, limited by time and space, to the macro level of macrocosmic oneness, unlimited by time and space. When the macro society was developed, everyone began the regular practice of mind shifting called macro pause. The secret of success with the macro pause has always been practice, beginning as early in life as possible. However, this does not mean that older people cannot learn to use the macro pause if they will only develop the following state of mind. A. Acceptance of a macro philosophy of life. B. Necessary desire and belief. C. Joyous acceptance of the absolute perfection of self, others, and the situation at hand. 
once these first two requirements have been achieved the third can be employed to achieve the macro pause whenever one's micro perspective is creating or failing to solve a problem it is this third requirement that frees the mind from its micro view and from its expansion to the broader macro perspective when this is achieved it's impossible to see anything as terrible the best way for a beginner to deal with fear anger and frustration is by using the macro pause after the macro pause was developed and used by all macro society members macro immersion was discovered only from the macro perspective can the frequency of soul vibrations be recognized while simultaneous twin soul incarnations have always been very rare simultaneous incarnation of soulmates who possess very similar though not identical soul vibrations are far more frequent in the macro society which always attracts souls with macro potential the number of soulmates that any soul shared an incarnation with reached eleven in every ten thousand this along with help of ci's audible soul note reproduction removed the final barriers to macro immersion the essentials for macro immersion are acceptance of the macro philosophy of life necessary desire and belief joyous acceptance of the absolute perfection of self others in the situation at hand that is let go and let's grow similarity of soul notes or vibrations either physical or telepathic perception of your soul notes and that of your partner macro immersion is a union of soulmates with high soul note similarity this permits union of the physical body and mind as well as the astral body and soul mind thus freeing sexuality from all micro restrictions an enduring sense of fulfillment and well-being are important fruits of macro immersion macro immersion allowed the macro society to completely free itself from the micro defensive uses of sex once macro immersion had been attained no other type of sexual experience was satisfying three macro contact was the final step in the expansion of human awareness that permitted macro man to attain a more enduring consciousness of the macrocosmic oneness of all while it is possible for the initiate to attain macro contact without first experiencing the macro pause or macro immersion this can only occur with the telepathic help of a soulmate who has already experienced macro contact due to problems with desire and belief this kind of help is only effective with the initial macro contact however the usual essentials for macro contact are acceptance of macro philosophy necessary desire and belief joyous acceptance of the absolute perfection of self others and the situation at hand let go and let's grow joyous acceptance of all positive and negative aspects of the universe self others god macrocosm and macro contact stimuli visual or audible may be necessary for the beginner until 2100 only few members of the macro society had ever attained anything more than the most fleeting macro contact lasting no more than a few seconds in the past 50 years however the true macro contact which typically lasts an hour or more was developed by the majority of macro society members this accounts for the swift increase in evolution since 2100 and the beginnings of level 10 the major problem with macro contact is that after one or two successive contacts one's desire is often greatly diminished due to the peaceful state of complete joyous acceptance created by macro contact this problem only exists at the lower macro levels though this is the end of the reading we leave you with the following farewell let's get together again bye for now